and uh, we move on to the last talk of. Okay, thanks. And that's Tomasz Brauner from Stavanger. And he will talk about anomaly induced homogeneous phases in UCD like theories. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And uh, thanks the organizers for inviting me to, to give this talk. Just a second before I set up. Okay, so I believe that we are now settled and you see my slides. Yes. Um, so what you what you hear in the next 30 minutes is a, is a kind of overview of, of work done in the last few years uh, in collaboration that started with Naoki Yamamoto and the more recent results I'll show you were obtained together with Helena Kolesheva and Georgios Filius, uh, both of whom I believe are in the, in the audience. Uh, the, the framework for this talk is uh, the question what how the phase diagram of QCD in strong magnetic fields looks like. And I will show you that there is a new interesting phase which carries a baryon number or baryon number density. And it has interesting properties in that uh, it is driven by the chiral anomaly and the baryon number density appears as a topological charge. I should also make a little disclaimer before I move on to my actual first slide. And that is everything you're gonna see here is a result of a low energy effective field theory, which means that the, the phase diagrams and phases I'll show you are model independent. Uh, they are stable uh, with respect to fluctuations, which are controlled by the derivative expansion of the effective theory. All right, so uh, let's, uh, let's move on. As said, I'm going to use the low energy effective field theory of QCD, which is the chiral perturbation theory. Uh, here's just a very, very brief reminder. I'll, uh, I'll constrain myself to two quark flavors for the whole talk, where we have the usual chiral symmetry that's spontaneously broken in the ground state to its vector subgroup. And this implies that the effective theory is formulated in terms of a matrix SU2 valued effective field, which I call sigma here, which carries the three pions in QCD. And so I forgot to mention that the first half of my talk roughly will be on QCD itself and the QCD-like theories I will get later on in the second half. So here is the effective Lagrangian to the leading order in the derivative expansion. Uh, it's completely fixed by two parameters, which you can identify as the pion mass and the pion decay constant. Uh, I will need one additional ingredient because I already said that the new phase of matter uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, uh, talk about is induced by the car anomaly. So I will need to implement the effects of the anomaly in the effective theory. And this is done, done, this is done by the so-called west sumino witten term. Uh, I'm not sure if all of you are familiar with uh, how this is constructed, but uh, we can skip the dirty details. I'll just uh, remind you of the one thing that we do learn about anomalies in our quantum field theory classes. And that is the anomaly can make uh, uh, electrically neutral particle interact with electromagnetic fields. For instance, the single fact probably that everybody, everybody heard about is that the chiral anomaly is responsible for the decay of neutral pions to two photons. Uh, what is perhaps slightly less known is that the anomaly can also make mesons carry baryon number. Uh, uh, this is probably not so mysterious to those who are familiar with the old Skira model, but in the effective theory, this is implemented in the following way. So you need a current, it's a, it's a topological current that's called the goldstone wilczek current. It's topological in that it's uh, identically conserved and that is coupled to some extent, to some gauge fields, uh, one of which is the gauge field, uh, the usual electromagnetic gauge field, and the other is an external source for baryon number. So a baryon number gauge field, if you want. This particular combination of those two gauge fields is fixed by the gelman nishijima relation. Uh, how the, exactly the current looks like, it's a little bit of a mess if you have not seen this before, but fortunately we are not going to need it because we are talking about QCD in strong magnetic fields. Now what happens in strong magnetic fields is that the charged pions become heavy by the Landau level quantization. And so they go away. In sufficiently strong magnetic fields and sufficiently low energies, the QCD boils down to the physics of neutral pions. And our effective theory simplifies tremendously. So first of all, if you take that SU2 valued field that we started with, 
and just keep the neutral pions that I represent here by a, by a dimensionless field phi. So there's just a pion field rescaled by the pion decay constant. The, the, the invariant part of the effective theory boils down to something that's actually pretty familiar as the sine Gordon model. And a lot is known about that. The anomaly, which uh, appeared to be a mess, the Vestumino term, all this thing that I showed in the previous slide simplifies to a single contribution to the effective Hamiltonian now, where you have a gradient of the pine field that dotted into the magnetic field that's external, fixed, and everything is multiplied by the baryon number chemical potential. Uh, so what we are going to do with this now, with this effective theory is that, well, we want to find the ground state and that will tell us what the ground state of QCD is in magnetic fields and in presence of a baryon number chemical potential. Now, the interesting thing about the, about the contribution of the anomaly here is that once we have thrown away the charged pions, this becomes a pure surface term. That's because the divergence of the magnetic field is zero. And and that means that it doesn't affect the equation of motion. So if you want to find the ground state of the Hamiltonian, you first look for all stationary states, and then you find which of them has the lowest energy. As far as the stationary states are considered, you can just ignore the anomaly, and you only keep the sine Gordon part. And finding the, finding the stationary states of this is mathematically equivalent to finding solutions of the equation of motion of a pendulum. So that's the thing that we learn about in the first semester mechanics classes. Only once you have done that, uh, you can go back and evaluate the energy of all the solutions that you have found, and that's where the anomaly, that's where the anomaly matters. Okay. So uh, in principle, details are actually pretty, pretty simple, especially if you want to go to Cairo limit. Things really simplify because the potential term that you had here in the Hamiltonian just goes away. And you'll see that the Hamiltonian is just a quadratic function of the gradient of the pine field. And we all know how to minimize a quadratic function. And you find that in the ground state, the pine field just grows linearly with the coordinate. So we have a non-trivial ground state in arbitrarily weak magnetic fields, as long as we are in the chiral limit. Now, off the chiral limit, as I said, we have to solve the equation of motion of a pendulum which can be done in terms of the Jacobi elliptic functions, uh, which we already heard about in the, in the previous talks. This is not a coincidence. One finds very similar structures for, uh, for a solitonic ground states. I'll spare you of uh, formulas containing lots of elliptic functions and rather show you uh, some pictures. So the solutions you find for the neutral pion field uh, can be parameterized by a single parameter that's called the elliptic modulus. And in terms of the analogy with the pendulum, you can think of that as the energy of, uh, of the pendulum. The elliptic modulus takes values between zero and one for uh, values that are not, uh, not too close to one. The, uh, the pine field is more or less linear as a function of coordinate as uh, in agreement with what we find previously in the chiral limit. Uh, only for values of the elliptic modulus very, very close to one, you find a kind of step-like structure. For the, for the pine field. Now, physically more interesting is the gradient of the pine field, because if we go back to the Hamiltonian here, you'll see that it's the gradient of the pine field that's multiplied by chemical potential. And that means that this piece here, the B dot gradient of the pine field with uh, a necessary constant here, has the interpretation of baryon number density. That's what we do in statistical physics, right? We have chemical potential times the operator of, uh, of, uh, of some conserved charge. Um, so the gradient of the pine field in these solutions measures baryon number density. And you see here also the profiles that you find for different values of the elliptic modulus. When the elliptic modulus is very close to one, you find basically localized clumps where baryon number density has a sharp peak and then nothing for a long time. And then again, a sharp peak and nothing. Uh, for elliptic modulus that's relatively small, you find pretty much a periodic cosine-like oscillations around some mean value uh, around some mean density. So these are all the different solutions or stationary states of the Hamiltonian. If you want to know what is the actual ground state, you have to evaluate the energy and find for which of the, uh, find the optimal value of the elliptic modulus. Uh, it turns out that this can be expressed in terms of a very simple analytical condition here. The, the, grounds, the, the value of the elliptic modulus in the ground state 
is fixed by this equation in terms of the product of chemical potential and magnetic field. On the left-hand side, E, there's the complete elliptic integral of the second kind. Um, again, better than formulas is, uh, is a picture. What we see is that when the thing on the right-hand side here becomes bigger than one, we find, we find a non-trivial modulated ground state. Uh, at the limit where the right-hand side here goes to one, the elliptic modulus is one, and the solution we find corresponds to a single domain wall. Uh, when the magnetic field increases, the elliptic modulus decreases, and you find the periodic modulation. Uh, that's what we call the chiral soliton lattice. So the ground state is a, is a solitonic crystal where baryon number is generated as a topological charge. Uh, in the right panel here, you see the lattice spacing. So because we have some periodic structure, uh, at the critical value of the magnetic field, the, the lattice spacing is infinity. That corresponds to a single domain wall, as I, as I mentioned. And as the magnetic field cranks up, the, 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 the lattice spacing becomes progressively smaller and smaller. If you want to see some numbers here, then I said the critical magnetic field uh, is determined by, by this here expression being equal to one. So that's the, that's the field that you have, to, you have to exceed in order to see this solitonic ground state. Now, that only depends on m pi and f pi, which are just numbers that are, that are fixed by experiment, and the chemical potential as a single tunable parameter. If you want to uh, have a, a order of magnitude uh, estimate or idea how big magnetic fields are required, let's just take some chemical potential that's uh, close to the onset of nuclear matter, but below. So we know that there, is, uh, there, there are no nucleons around. Uh, if you take 900 MeV, you find that the critical field that's required is roughly this. Okay, so this is it's definitely large by everyday standards. On the other hand, it's small enough to be under control of the low energy effective theory. It's uh, it's uh, well below the QC, lambda QCD, the scale of uh, of QCD. Uh, okay, so that was the that was uh, that was as to the ground state. Now. Uh, uh, after one of the previous talks, there was a question as to how do the excited states look? How that, what are the collective excitations of such a crystalline state? So I have an answer here, actually. Uh, well, once you have a crystal, then you have to go to condensed matter to learn what happens. And we know that uh, crystals break spontaneous translations, and so you expect a Golson boson. That's called a phonon, sound wave. And indeed, we find that there are, there are propagating phonons, which are massless or gapless even though the original pions we started with are massive. So even away from chiral limit, we find exactly massless collective modes. What you see here in this picture is the, is the phase velocity of the phonons as a function of the magnetic field at the critical value of the magnetic field where uh, uh, the, the, the phase velocity goes to zero. But then with increasing field, it, it quickly increases towards the speed of light. For those who like elliptic functions, Okay, here is an analytic, analytic expression, but I prefer more the picture. Um, then there are the, uh, the charged pions in principle. Uh, one might want to reintroduce them uh, into the effective theory and ask, well, how do the charged pion fluctuations behave on the non-trivial solitonic background that we found? Uh, it's not too difficult, it's, it's a little work. Uh, the result is very interesting though. It turns out that in a sense that the, the, the crystalline modulated ground state behaves as a kind of source or chemical potential for charged pions. Um, in principle, the, 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 the spectrum of charged pions can be solved analytically. It's, 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 a little bit, uh, it's a little bit nasty because it leads to something that's called Lamé equation. And you need to go to the mathematical physics literature to, to understand the structure. Uh, you find both for the phonons and for the charged points that there is a band structure, which is something that we expect uh, in crystals, uh, but this can be done. At the end of the day, what you find is this. Here is a phase diagram. This is the phase diagram of QCD in the plane of magnetic field and baryon chemical potential. Everything is zero temperature because we are using the leading order effective theory. So there are no loops, effectively the temperature is zero. What we find is that when the magnetic field times chemical potential is small, we are in the vacuum phase with the, with the uniform chiral condensate. When the product of magnetic field and chemical potential exceeds certain critical value that I discussed before, we enter the phase with this solitonic ground state. 
that we call the chiral soliton lattice, so CSL uh, shortly. Uh, Interestingly, if you, when you look at the structure of the uh, charged pion spectrum, it turns out that the effect of the modulated background can outweigh the, the lambda level quantization due to the magnetic field. And at sufficiently strong magnetic field, the energy of the charged pion seems to drop to zero, uh, which indicates an instability of the, of the solid on the ground state towards possibly condensation of charged pions. Uh, now, all this is drawn for the physical value of the pion mass. Uh, if you go to the chiral limit, uh, arbitrary weak magnetic field will do. That means that this critical line for entering the chiral soliton lattice will just go down to zero. All this space in the chiral limit will be filled by the, by the solitonic, chiral soliton lattice phase. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the, the possible Farther transition to a phase where with uh, condensation of charged pions doesn't really change much. So the dashed line here corresponds to the chiral limit. But I should warn you, I, I put a question mark here because this may already well be this line, maybe beyond the reach of the validity of the effective theory. Um, okay, so this is about QCD. Um, now let's see. Uh, whether one could one could observe a similar phenomenon in other theories in QCD, and I'll, I'll explain the motivation for doing so shortly on the next slide. Uh, what I mean by QCD-like theories for the purposes of this talk is theories where quarks, which are vector-like, and quarks sit in a real or pseudo-real representation of the gauge group. That means the theory has some kind of invariance under, under the exchange of quarks and anti-quarks. Uh, it's important to distinguish uh, theories where the quarks are real or pseudo-real because they have different properties. Uh, examples of real are, for instance, a, a QCD with quarks in the adjoint representation or more exotic possibilities, uh, QCD with the G2 gauge group. Pseudo, the simplest pseudo-real theory would be one where you just uh, replace the usual SU3 color group with SU2 and keep quarks in the fundamental representation. That's, that is pseudo-real. Uh, both of these classes have in common that you can make baryons out of two out of two quarks. That is, uh, you can make bosonic baryons, namely, namely diquarks. Uh, they also have in common that uh, they have a bigger global flavor symmetry, thanks to the fact that, in a sense, quarks and antiquarks behave in the same way. They interact with the with the gauge fields in the same way, and so instead of the usual chiral group where we have S U N left times S U N right we have a larger SU2N symmetry for N massless uh, flavors of quarks. And that's responsible for a modified spectrum in, uh, in the vacuum. Once you break the, uh, once you break the symmetry uh, spontaneously by the chiral condensate in the ground state, it turns out that you have two types of uh, pseudo Gaussian bosons now. One type are the usual uh, pions or pseudo scalar mesons if you want. But in addition, we can now have Goldstone boson dyquarks. So we have light variants in the spectrum, and that actually makes it possible to study the phase diagram of these theories using the effective theory, because we can now introduce baryon chemical potential in the low energy effective theory, and we have some particles in the spectrum which are sensitive uh, to the chemical potential. Now, why are these theories interesting? Uh, well, the thing is that uh, they turn out to be free of the sign problem even in the presence of the baryon number chemical potential. Uh, or to be more precise, uh, in pseudo-real theories, you need, uh, sorry, the, the determinant of the Dirac operator is real. If you want to make it positive, in addition, you need to take an even number of flavors in pseudo-real theories. In real theories, it is already positive. Now, the question is, if we want to add now an external magnetic field, does this property survive? The answer is yes, but at a little cost. Uh, we can maintain the uh, absence of sign problem in these theories, provided that we choose uh, the electric charges of quarks suitably. And that is, by suitably, I mean we have to assign the U and D quarks charges of equal magnitude and opposite sign. But these theories are not real, they are not QCD anyway, so why not? We can take the electric charges to be, for instance, plus minus one half. Uh, so that uh, you have 
uh, you have uh, dike works which have uh, which have electric charge one, and you have mesons which have electric charge uh, which have electric charge either one or zero. Uh, then it turns out that the theories in this for this choice of electric charges have a, a discrete uh, discrete uh, conjugation symmetry, which makes the determinants of the Dirac operator in the U and D quark sectors complex conjugate to each other, and so you have uh, the the determinant of the full theory is positive. And now there's another reason why this why this is interesting, and that is uh, regarding inhomogeneous phases in the phase diagram. It was conjectured by Split of Son and Stefanov back in 2001 that there might be a, a deeper connection between the sign problem and the presence of inhomogeneous phases in the phase diagram. Namely, uh, basically based on a on a on a case study uh, of of different. Uh, different theories with different combinations of chemical potentials and and, uh, and quark representations, they conjectured that whenever a theory is free of the sign problem in the sense that the determinant of the Dirac operator is positive, the the translation invariance cannot be spontaneously broken. That is, there are no inhomogeneous phases in the phase diagram. One of the main results of of our work, if you want, is that we found an explicit counterexample. To this so this conjecture is not correct. Uh, so let's let's get to it. Uh, we want to construct an effective theory again because that's our tool uh, gives model independent results. Well, we have to look at how the symmetry is affected by the magnetic field. So originally we started with SU SU2n, which for two flavors would be SU4, but the magnetic field breaks the symmetry explicitly. And so if you ask, well, what is the symmetry that is left by the magnetic field? Surprisingly. It turns out that for exactly our choice of electric charges that we just made, the flavor symmetry boils down to SU2 cross SU2 cross U1. It looks just like QCD, uh, but it's not. This is not the same symmetry as in QCD, in particular because the non-abelian part here, SU2 cross SU2, includes barrier number. And the U1 is not barrier number as in QCD. The U1 is the electric charge. But the, the, the formal analogy with QCD actually is great because we can, we can then reuse the effective theory that we know for QCD. It turns out all we have to do is that we have to swap the roles of barrier number and electric charge. Otherwise, we can keep the same effective theory. Uh, the, the low energy spectrum now will contain uh, three modes, just like in QCD, except that they are not the three pions. They are one, the neutral pion, and then an electrically neutral quark anti dike quark, uh, sorry, uh, uh, dike quark anti dike quark pair. That's all that's left uh, once you have switched on the magnetic field and all the charged particles have gone away because they become heavy by lambda level quantization. And this is true for both the real and pseudo real theories. Now, the effective Lagrangian will now look like this. I now uh, allow for a possibility of the magnetic field to be really strong. And by really strong, I mean even comparable or even stronger than the scale of the QCD-like theory, the lambda QCD. Uh, the effective theory may then still be valid, provided that the, the flavor symmetry is broken still by the chiral condensate in the ground state. So our symmetry breaking pattern for the global symmetry remains the same. This seems to be supported by the fact that we know that magnetic field leads to, uh, leads to magnetic catalysis. So it supports the, the chiral condensate in the ground state. So if we take this as an assumption, then we can actually construct the effective theory valid in, in principle, arbitrarily strong magnetic fields at the little cost. So first the theory becomes anisotropic. And that means that wherever we were, where we were originally contracting Lorentz indices, we have to now introduce two different metrics, which affect, account for the fact that we now have a, a reduced one dimensional Lorentz one plus one dimension Lorentz invariance with boosts along the direction of the magnetic field. That's the parallel thing here. And then we have rotation invariance in the, in the two dimensional transverse plane. Now, if we allow for strong magnetic fields, we have to change the power counting of the effective theory. Uh, we have to make the magnetic field formally of order zero. And that means that the dependence on the magnetic field is completely arbitrary and it's, it's hidden in the parameters. So there is still the pi and decay constant and the m pi and there's a new velocity parameter, which is due to the anisotropy. And those may depend on the magnetic field in principle in an arbitrary way now. With these modifications, we, we have an effective theory that's valid also in strong magnetic fields. And then we have the Westumino term. 
which is rigid. That's fixed because it's fixed by the, by the symmetry, by the anomaly. It only comes with two parameters, one of which counts the baryon number of a single quark, which we can choose to be whatever we want. And one parameter, which is, which is fixed by the, by the chiral anomaly, that's the overall scale of the Vestamino term. And this is the only place where the choice of the concrete gauge group actually matters. Until now, I haven't chosen any. I just said, well, let's suppose that the representation of the quarks is real or pseudo real. I haven't said what the gauge group is, and it can be any, as long as the representation is real or pseudo real uh, representation in which the quarks sit. So this is only parameter where this shows D, which measures the dimension. It counts the number of color degrees of freedom. It measures the dimension of the representation in which a single quark flavor transforms. With this, then I'll just skip right away uh, to the phase diagram because I'm slowly running out of time. So here is how the phase diagram is going to look. Again, in the plane of the magnetic field and the uh, uh, baryon chemical potential, they are now rescaled suitably so that they are dimensionless. We see at low B and low mu, again, the vacuum phase with the chiral condensate. What's new now is that, well, we know that we have condensation of uh, Golson bosons, condensation of the quarks when we crank up sufficiently large chemical potential at zero magnetic field. Uh, that definitely has to be the case uh, when the chemical potential exceeds the, the pion or the quark mass. And so we expect that in, slow, in sufficiently low magnetic fields, this BEC phase, where you have a conden uniform condensate of quarks will survive. At the, on the other hand, in strong enough magnetic fields, we still expect the chiral soliton lattice to appear. So we now have a competition of two non-trivial ordered phases. And what you see here is just a result of an explicit calculation. Now, it, this all looks very nice. Uh, it appears that, well, we have proven that there is an inhomogeneous phase, also in theory three of the same problem. So we have disproved that old conjecture of split or so on, split off so on and Stefanov that, that, that which said that there couldn't be any such inhomogeneous phases in theory is free of the same problem. Well, there's a little catch here, and that is, well, I told you before that all the parameters depend on magnetic fields. So the question is, can we, the, the color soliton lattice only exists above certain critical value of the field. Can this field be reached? Because if you expand the dependence on the magnetic field, the, uh, having field that's stronger than the critical field amounts to this kind of condition where now f pi is, remember, is a parameter that may depend on the magnetic field in some a priori arbitrary way. So this is not a linear condition in B field, which you just say you have to exceed certain threshold and that's it. Uh, if we don't know how the, how the parameter f pi in the effective theory depends on magnetic field, we cannot say much. Fortunately, there is a dependence on the, on the gauge group choice. And we'll see that uh, the, the critical field, the condition for the critical field is suppressed by one over D, where D is the dimension of the, of the, uh, of the representation in which the quarks sit. And so we expect that when we take sufficiently large gauge group, so when the D is large, we can make uh, the uh, critical field small. And when that is the case, uh, we can make the critical field under control of the derivative expansion. Uh, you may remember that four pi F pi, the combination I chose here, that's not an accident. That is that that counts the loops in the effective theory. So that's that's the characteristic scale of the effective theory. And if the magnetic field were stronger than four pi f pi, the effective field theory would break down in the derivative expansion. But when if we if you take a theory where d is large enough, we can make it work. The question is how large d has to be. Uh, that's that's hard to tell in. Uh, of course, we have some we have some uh, some information about about the dependence of the f pi on magnetic field. So for pseudo real QC like theories, we have this one loop perturbative result for the dependence of, of f pi on the magnetic field, which is very which can be used to verify that when when d is large enough, indeed the one loop correction, which is this term here, is just negligible. Unfortunately, for the simple theories which have been studied vigorously on the lattice, such as two color QCD. Uh, it's not, it's not, it, the, the conclusion is not, uh, it's not obvious. What, what we see is that uh, uh, it's consistent to expect that the chiral soliton lattice will appear in the phase diagram of two color QCD, but in order to be sure, we would need some, some independent information on the profile, on the dependence of F pi on the magnetic field. 
Yes, so that's, that's it. Here are the conclusions. Uh, I will just skip through them. The main message is that uh, QCD and uh, a class of other QCD-like theories, which include uh, two-color QCD, QCD with adjoint quarks, but also QCD with isospin chemical potential, for instance, become unstable with respect to formation of, uh, of a new solitonic uh, phase in sufficiently strong magnetic field. And this is a correct, this is a consequence of the chiral anomaly. Uh, there are lots of things that still need to be done. So, so far, everything has been at tree level. There is no temperature. Uh, one may consider uh, temperature correction, finite temperature corrections, or have a look at how, how the soliton lattice uh, feel, fits in a finite volume. What happens when the magnetic fields are not, uh, are not uniform, for instance? There's a number of directions one can do. Some of them are under, uh, under, under investigation currently. But I'll stop here because I'm running out of time. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Um, actually, I, I would have a question, but maybe I also shift that to the discussion session. But uh, are there other questions, in particular clarifying questions about what was said? Yeah, we have our usual suspect, so Ruska Mahaljani. Uh, you identified inhomogeneous condensates as soliton lattice, right? Yes. Uh, you have also baryon. One uh, baryon number is one uh, condensate. Mm -hmm. If you like, even baryon from the point of view of pine field is condensate, inhomogeneous mm -hmm. condensate, mm -hmm. uh, minimal one. What about few baryon number condensates like a fulleron or some uh, light nucleus and so on. Maybe it, they will be difficult to identify uh, in analytic form or uh, it's easier to find as some numerical uh, structure, perhaps as nuclear, bonds, uh, nuclear as a phenomena is difficult solid state and elementary particle few particle states are easier to the, describe than finite um, number of particle bound states. So anyway, uh, you can uh, in similar picture identify uh, nuclear bound states, uh, something toy nuclears and even uh, scattering of the heavy nucleus you can model in this model. Um, so, uh, um, okay, uh, let me just briefly reply. You. Uh, you're right. Uh, of course, this uh, goes back to the old Skira model where you, you generate a baryon as a soliton made of pine fields. And there is a distinction uh, between, between the two. A Skira model, as the name suggests, is a model. What we use here is, uh, is an effective theory, which has a well-defined derivative expansion and quantum corrections, in principle, loop corrections are under control of that expansion. There's, the difference is that if you want to generate the, 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 the baryon as a, as a, as a solid on the schema model, you need to stabilize. You need to add high derivative terms that, that would stabilize your solitonic solution. So in, in a sense, you are, you're, you're, you're comparing, you're, you're equating uh, contributions of terms with different numbers of derivatives. And this automatically tells you that any kind of derivative expansion breaks down. In terms of physical scales, uh, we, uh, we uh, intentionally keep chemical potentials below the nucleon scale uh, because then we are sure that there are no nucleons around. So we have a corner here. When I show the phase diagram of QCD here, we have a corner of the phase diagram where there are no nucleons. If it were not for the solitonic lattice that we propose, there would be just vacuum. And because this is model independent, we are confident that the phase actually exists it, it has nothing else to compete with. This is a phase that exists in the phase diagram of QCD. The only possible question is if it could be realized, realized in nature. Okay. Thank you again. I